let the rocks cry out. God gave me a vision of all the empty church buildings that are all over the world. And that those church buildings aren't filled with people, that there are rocks crying out the testimony of the Lord of past times. And he wants us as living stones, living stones to cry out, to give God glory so that buildings don't testify of the glory of God, but that his children testify of the glory of God. He is the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone. And we lay our weight upon him as living stones. Declare the goodness of God, you living stone. Wake up, he will give you a heart of flesh where there has been 
bless the Lord together. Come on, let's give them some resounding praise in this place this morning. Come on, somebody lift up a shout unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is worthy of it. He is deserving of it. All that you've got, give Him your best. Lord, we love you. We bless you from this house this morning. We glorify you. We magnify you. You are worthy. You are holy. You are awesome. You are wonderful. Jesus, you are good. Your goodness knows no bounds. And we are a grateful people for it. How many saved people do I have in the room today? <laughs> you know, we've gotten so used to saying that word, I'm saved, that we use it simultaneously with, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. But when you say I'm saved, you gotta take a moment to remember what Jesus has saved you from. I don't know where you would be without him this morning, but I do know where I would be without him this morning. And I know that I would not be here. And when I say here, I don't mean church. I say here as in alive. But because of what he accomplished on the cross, I can stand here this morning, worship him in spirit and in truth. I won't let the rocks cry out on my time. I can worship Him with praise and love and adoration, and I can remind myself that I am saved. <laughs> you know, you never struggle to give Him high praise when you remember what He has saved you from. How far He's brought you, all the good things He's done in your life, all the provision He's added to your life, we praise you today, Lord Jesus, for all that you have done in our lives, for all that you're doing in our lives. Even when it does not seem like you're working, we know you're working behind the scenes, Lord Jesus, and we give you praise and we say thank you for saving us. Church, could we give them another high praise and tell them thank you. Thank you for saving me. You are glorious, you are good, you are merciful. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Doesn't it feel good to be saved? <laughs> I remember the very first time I ever lifted my hands in worship after I was saved. Very first time, I can tell you exactly where I was standing in the church that I was saved in. And I lifted my hands for the first time and I remember thinking, is anybody looking at me? I thought somebody would start making fun of me. Like if I lifted my hands, I go, oh, there he goes, lifting his hands. Take a picture. But I remember the first time I lifted my hands and I heard the Holy Spirit whisper to my heart, how does it feel to know that you're going to heaven? <laughs> so I think that's how we should finish this moment of worship. Let's all just lift our hands. And I want you to remind your soul that you are eternally saved, not because of anything that you have done, not because you're so awesome, not because you've been on your best behavior, but because of who Jesus is and how great he is and how much he loves you. Everybody say it with me. Say, Jesus, we praise you and we thank you that we are saved. Come on, let's bless him again. Hey, find three or four saved people around you. Give them a hug or a high five. Say, I'm glad I'm sitting next to you. I'm glad I'm in church with you today. So good to be here. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Once you've uh, said hello to a few people, you can be seated. We love you. Jesus, what was the dream that you had in your heart whenever you said, and upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. I want to be a part of the church that you are building. The church and the spirit were always meant to live together. Hey, I don't want to be stuck in what God was doing. God, I want to be a part of what you're doing in the earth right now. Come together right now. Over me. May the train of his robe fill.
fill the temple. And may every person know that he's here. Come on, let's go. Legacy Conference 2022. Who's excited for this? I'm gonna need some more help, 1030. Who's excited for this? This is awesome. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be so much fun. As you notice there, our conference theme this year is United because we are going to unite together as one family right here at 901 Delbrook Lane. And we are gonna experience three days, not only with one another, but with Jesus and have a momentous encounter with him. Behold his glory, be transformed by his hand. And we're gonna see God do something miraculous in our church. If you believe that, just say, I believe that. That's what we're gonna do. So I wanna let you know that today is the day. If you were thinking, what is that special announcement that they teased us with on Instagram? It's that conference tickets are on sale now. Now, so here's the thing. Like, I don't know if you grew up with siblings like I did. I had three. And right before we would get in the minivan to go somewhere, we would say, shotgun. Did y'all do that? And whoever said shotgun first got to sit up front. Did y'all do that? So y'all, by y'all, I mean all y'all. If you're not from Nashville, welcome to the family. Get the opportunity this morning to shout shotgun. Because here's the thing, tickets are going to sell out by the end of the day. In Jesus' name, I'm prophesying. But they, they most likely will because we only have, I think, about 375 tickets that we're selling. And the 9 a.m. has already got a jump on you. So you were not the first people to yell shotgun. All right? And this service is being streamed. So there's probably going to be some people who are watching online on YouTube that are going to say shotgun with you from their couch. But we want to let you know what the mission and the vision of this conference is so that you can come with expectation. Our goal for this conference is to equip, uplift, and y'all say it with me, unite the Legacy Nashville family through three days of worship and powerful preaching. It's gonna be so much fun. I'm gonna be preaching. My wife, Pastor Allison, is gonna be preaching. And, and our, our new dear friend, our beloved brother, Pastor Robert Madu from Social Dallas is gonna be preaching. And he's probably one of the best preachers that I know, I, when I had the opportunity to speak at Social Dallas earlier this year, I referred to him as the baby goat. Because I'm like, if T.D. Jakes is the goat, Robert Madu's got to be the baby goat. I, I was so nervous preaching for him, y'all. The last time I was that nervous preaching was when I preached for Bill Johnson, and Bill Johnson wasn't even there, so... He didn't invite me, but it was his pulpit, so I felt afraid. But we're going to have an amazing conference. We're going to kick off on Thursday evening, get this, with a live recording of a new album. This side of the room, they woke up a little bit late. But I want to tell this side of the room that we're going to kick off with a, a live recording of a new album. It's gonna be awesome. That's gonna happen on Thursday. There will be no chairs in the room. So even if you don't get a ticket for the conference, but you wanna to come to that, you can come to that. We're gonna just push all the people that we can into this room standing only for a worship night. Then we'll kick off, uh, we'll do Friday night uh, with Pastor Robert, Saturday morning with my wife, Saturday night with me. And then we're gonna be doing a special leaders uh, time on Friday morning with Pastor Robert. So. If you know that you've got a leadership mantle on your life and you just want to be in the room with a great kingdom leader, my wife and I will be sharing some, but we'll really have him sharing quite a bit. We want you to come out, be a part of that as well. And here's what I think is the best part of the whole conference. Are you ready for it? We're going to be having a legacy kids conference simultaneously this year as the United Conference, and that's gonna happen over at 900 Gallatin. 
We're going to have ministry of the word, worship. It's going to be amazing. Our kids are going to encounter God. They're, they're going to get in your minivan, and they're going to testify, I encountered God. It's going to happen. So you want to register your kids, be there. It's going to be, it's going to be the best thing we've ever done. We've never had a kids conference before. We've always had child care. We didn't last year. So if you came last year, like, what are you talking about? Well, we didn't last year, but we, we've usually had child care this year, full-blown kids conference. And uh, while she's up here, I want to honor Pastor Sonia, as well as Jenna Lee, as well as Pastor Michelle, for all the amazing work that's happening at Legacy Kids. If you have kids, then you know what I'm testifying about right now. Our kids are being so blessed by Pastor Sonia and Jenna Lee and Pastor Michelle and everybody involved, the whole Legacy Kids team, everybody leading worship, everybody ministering. It's amazing. My kids have been coming away from church with testimonies. Um, the other night I was telling Isaiah, we were like, we were praying together before bed and, and we were doing the Lord's Prayer, which we're actually gonna start a study series on today. I'm excited for that. And um, he was telling me things that Mr. Toll had told him at Legacy Academy. I don't know if y'all know it or not, but Jarrett is a teacher now at Legacy Academy. And I heard Coach Clardy is a teacher now at Legacy Academy as well. Let's go. Can we officially say coach now? Is that the new designation? All right, okay, I like it. I like it. It's our PE teacher right there. Um, but he, he was telling me things that he had learned in school and in uh, the revival service and the kids. And, and he said, Dad, like the, like, the, like the five H's. Y'all don't know what the five H's are probably, some of you, but that's our leadership code. And he said, all oh, the five H's. And I said, yeah, the five H's are good, aren't they? He said, yeah, they're good. He said, God gave us the five H's. I said, boy, I wrote the five H's. He said, no, you didn't. I said, I did. He said, no, that's from the Bible. <laughs> I said, well, you're not wrong. So I was trying to convince him that his dad was great. And I don't think I ever did. We just prayed and he went to bed. But all of you have the opportunity to buy tickets today. So I want you to do that or go on, scan the QR we're selling tickets through an app called Brushfire this year. You actually have the opportunity to put 50% down on your ticket and pay the other 50% later so that you can reserve your seat. But here's the thing, all right? I'm gonna do a moment of pastoral fathering. Are you ready? If you don't show up, we're keeping your money. If you email us two weeks before, I mean, listen, if you have an emergency, we're going to give grace because, you know, his mercy endureth forever. But if you're just being sketchy or flaky, that's the right word I'm looking for. Not sketchy, but if you're sketchy too, um, your money's an offering. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you now. Because, listen, I'm just, I'm just being honest. Like, as the pastor of this church, here's my bone to pick. We do these RSVPs. We're like, we're going to do RSVP. Everybody's going to show up. It's packed. We shut it down. There are people trying to come in out of town. Other people that weren't in church, they want to get to the worship night. They want to encounter Jesus. And then 20% of people who RSVP, they don't show up. So, so we're going to keep the 50% as a guilt offering. It's biblical. <laughs> All right. All right, and if you can't come, you're gonna be out of town, buy a ticket to watch online. This is the first time we're ever gonna do this. We're actually gonna sell tickets so you can watch online and be a part. We're gonna make that experience awesome, by the way. It's not just like, well, I do watch online on YouTube on Sundays. It's gonna be new and improved. And so we want you to be a part of that. So once again, how many are excited for the Legacy Conference? I am excited. It's gonna fill up today. So if you're thinking like, oh, I should probably come, you want to buy your ticket and buy your kids' tickets today, all right? Everybody said? Amen. Amen. 
Awesome. Well, before we kick off into this new sermon series that we're going to begin today, um, I do want to take a moment and give us all the opportunity to honor the Lord through our giving. Uh, We're going to continue our worship now. If this is your home church, now is an opportunity for you to obey God through the scripture and tithe to the storehouse, your home church. You can do so by scanning the QR code up here. And um, it's super easy. You'll get a prompt in like 30 seconds and you'll be able to give. If you are a member of the church and you've not yet set your tithe to recurring, I want to encourage you to do that, all right? Because we don't want to be neglectful or forgetful when it comes time to worship the Lord in obedience, all right? So I've just had another pastoral, uh, what did I call it? A father moment. Okay, I've had two. I think I only get three per sermon, so better clean it up. Nobody's laughing. It's the offering. (laughs) But if if you would like to simply sow a seed into good soil, you can give an offering through the link as well. So what I want to do is I just want to pray over the finances of this house. Um, God wants to bless you. You guys agree? In every way. In every way, not just financially, in every way. One of the five H's is holistically healthy. We want you to be financially healthy. And and we believe that God wants you to be financially blessed. And so we want to pray over your finances. So if you're giving by phone, take your phone. If you need to take hold of a wallet or a purse or something else as a... um, point of contact for your faith, you can do so. And we're going to pray now in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you so much for blessing us financially. You have surely given us an abundance. Lord, I I pray today that for anybody in the room or watching online that has a lens of lack fixed over their eyes, I pray that the hand of God would remove that lens of lack and that you would give us grace to see through a lens of abundance. You own the cattle on a thousand hills, God. You created it all. From the beginning to the end, every good gift comes down from above, Lord. And so we know we are your sons and your daughters. And so we are asking God for financial blessing. We're praying specifics today. If there's anybody in here that needs a down payment, God, I pray in Jesus' name that you meet their needs supernaturally, that they would be surprised by their opportunity to testify because they have a down payment. For somebody that's in head over heels in medical debt, God, I pray for favor. Uh, with bill collectors and people who are looking for that debt to be repaid, that it would be supernaturally diminished in Jesus' name. People who are head over heels in student loans, for the same for them in Jesus' name. God, I pray for everybody who has a business, for every entrepreneur. I pray that they would get an idea while I'm preaching to put a note in their phone to take action on after church that's going to bless their families financially in Jesus' name. If you receive that, say amen. 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 All right. Well, let's, let's jump into this. I'm very excited about this new series. It is called Teach Us to Pray. You might be thinking, we just did a whole series on worship. You can do a whole series on prayer? Yes. Because we like both. We like to worship and we like to pray. And I, I really felt while we were away on our summer sabbatical in prayer that this was the will of God for our house next, yeah. is that we needed to dive deeper into understanding what the Bible has to teach us about our praying. How many of you guys would like to be better prayers? Yes. You'd like to pray better, yeah. right? Can I tell you that the prayer life of your dreams is attainable? Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The prayer life of your dreams is attainable. And if, if you're thinking, I don't dream about praying. <laughs> Let me say it a different way. Whatever you imagine to be faithful praying, strong, powerful, dynamic prayers in your life, I want you to know that that prayer life is attainable for you. That's good. That's good, sir. All right, right from the start, I wanna just ignite your heart with hope. You can be a fervent, dynamic, effectual, righteous prayer warrior. All right, 
You can be that. And, and, and if, if you're sitting somewhere and you're like, oh, he's talking about the people who always say amen up in the, not, who, who said amen better when we were talking about the conference? This side, yeah, sorry. We're gonna get, up. We're gonna get back to y'all. Come on, coach, come on, coach. If you're thinking, yeah, hey, hey, if you're thinking I, he was talking about those people up there that said amen when, you know, the conference video was shown. No, I'm talking about everybody. All right? If you are saved, everybody say, I'm saved. I'm saved. And if you're not, we'll give you that opportunity by the end of the service. You can grow in prayer. You can have the prayer life of your dreams. You can be a dynamic and effectual prayer warrior. A powerful prayer life is attainable for you. Something Smith Wigglesworth uh, said that has just been on my heart as I prepared for this was this. He said, I would rather teach one man to pray than 10 men to preach. So, so that, that has marked me as I've been preparing for this sermon series. So I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter six. Uh, we're gonna refer to start to the first time that Jesus gave us what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. And as you're turning to Matthew chapter six, I'm gonna turn to Luke chapter 11 and I'm gonna read one verse of scripture to get us started. So put your thumb in Matthew six. Here's what Luke chapter 11 verse one says. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Now that's pretty amazing because the disciples, when they listened to Jesus pray, they were reminded of John the Baptist praying, and they were reminded of John the Baptist teaching his disciples, and so they wanted Jesus to teach them the way that John had taught his disciples. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty impressive when it comes to John the Baptist and the prayer life that he obviously had. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's amazing. So I would assume here that the disciples were eavesdropping and listening to Jesus praying because it says he was praying in a certain place and when he finished, the disciples asked him, have you ever listened to somebody else pray and you're like, hey, uh, can you teach me how to pray like that? Because I don't know what it is. It's not your words. It's not about your style. It's not about your cadence, but it is about the atmosphere. And I notice when you start praying, I feel something different. I may hear something similar as to what I hear when other people pray, but when you pray, woman of God, the atmosphere shifts. You guys know what I'm talking about? There's been people in my life that I have met and before I ever shook their hand, I just watched them walk into the room. I was like, something different about them. I don't know what it is. I mean, I do, but I don't know. I don't know what they've got a hold of. I don't know what kind of revelation they've received. I don't know about the anointing that they're walking in, but I can tell that it is immense. And I pray this quiet prayer in my heart. I say, God, I want that. God, I want that. God, I want that. And I'm not talking about their ministry status. I'm talking about the connection they have to the Spirit. Because I can tell. I'm like, there's something different. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like for some of y'all, you had like some praying grandmothers. Yeah. And when granny got a hold of you, you were like, man, she knows how to connect to God. Yep. I mean, I remember this growing up in church. It's like certain people, when it was time for them to pray, you just didn't look them in the eye. You know what I mean? Because you're like, man, I don't need her to read my mail. You know what I mean? Because like, you know that they got a connection with God. You're walking down the hall and you see like, you know, prophet so-and-so coming. Like, Better check my phone. Or somebody starts giving out words of knowledge and like, you know, knowledge and they're like walking and you're like. It's like the teacher, you know, in fifth grade, you don't know the answer to the math question. Like, I'm going to sharpen my pencil. Uh, that, that's something I've always noticed, and I believe that perhaps uh, the disciples, they obviously noticed this about Jesus. They're like, hold on, wait, there's something different about Jesus because whenever Jesus prays, there's something about his prayers that feel different. And not only does the atmosphere shift whenever he starts praying, but we're also watching what he does when he leaves the prayer closet. It seems as though he is touching heaven in a different way because he walks in a different character. 
It's very interesting, you know. Uh, what is he doing that we're not doing? Because whenever he steps out of the secret place, he steps out with power. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's cleansing lepers. He, he's casting out devils. What is it about his prayer life? And I know it's very popular to say, I want the ministry of Jesus. He said that we would do greater things. I want the ministry of Jesus. God, give me the ministry of Jesus. If you want the ministry of Jesus, what you're actually confessing is that you want the prayer life of Jesus. Because the power is a byproduct of prayer. If you want the power, what you're saying is, I want God. I want him to take hold of me in the place of prayer so that when I exit the prayer closet, I stay saturated with his anointing. Uh, young people ask me from time to time, how do I get more anointed? It's very easy. You pray. Well, I'm not very good at prayer. Listen, I know that today culture would suggest to you that unless you were born a spiritual savant, you will never be good at prayer because oftentimes we see prayer as an innate ability. But I don't want you to look at prayer as though I'm either born with it or I'm not. What I want you to see prayer as, as we traverse through this series, is a skill. Or if you're more of like a creative, because we're in East Nashville, I want you to see it as an art form. All right, if you're a little bit more like, you know, you work with your hands, oh, my, my manly men, manly men. If, you, if that's you, if you, I want you to look at it as a skill. All right, when you first started doing whatever you do for your profession, you were not good at it. And that did not cause you to give up. You recognized yourself as an amateur. You said, I don't know how to do this very well yet. I'm just getting started. And even if you've been exposed to it for a couple of decades, that does not necessarily make you good at it. You've got to get in the game. You've got to start practicing it. Somebody at some point has to hand you the tool and say, okay, now you try that's what we're doing in this series. You may have been exposed to people praying well in your life for a long time, but until you start actually praying, you are not going to excel at prayer. All right? Um, Spurgeon said something like this. It's in my notes, but I've forgotten it. Do you guys have a quote on him? It's something about prayer is not learned in a book or something like that. Prayer is learned in the prayer closet. Is that right? It's way deep in the notes. Don't even try to find it, Jen. I'm just going to confuse you. But I'll get to it probably. So in order to hone this skill, you've got to actually pray. Okay? So what I don't want you to do is step out of the sanctuary for the next six, seven weeks and be like, man, he just didn't convince me that I'm a good prayer warrior. Unless you actually take it home and you pray, you're not gonna get better at it. You learn to pray by praying, right? I remember my, my prayer pastor in Texas used to say, OJT, on the job training. That's the way you're gonna get it, right? Now, um, I mentioned this to the first service, but I thought about the illustration in the moment of like a, a, a pianist, you know? Um, I love watching people who are really good at the piano play the piano. Anybody else? I don't know, I just like watching YouTube videos of musicians like killing it at their craft. Anybody else? You're like, that's amazing. Anybody else get stuck in those TikTok loops? Like, impressive, right? So like if, and I don't know why, I just love watching people excel at the keys and like, so you're watching an amazing pianist and they're doing their thing and they're playing Beethoven or some difficult classical piece. Like how ridiculous would you guys think that I was if I walked over to that pianist after they finished their recital and I say, hey, can you lay hands on me? Because I'd like to be able to play the piano like that. And then he's like, well, I, you know, uh, you're probably gonna have to, you know, take some lessons, uh, but sure, because he's a charismatic Pentecostal. And so he says, here you go. And he starts saying things like, take it, take it. You know? And you're like, I'm taking it. 
I receive it in the name of the Lord. Sha ta 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 ta. Right? And so then, and so then you sit down and you're like, and it's like it's all over the place and you're not good yet you might be tempted to be offended by the guy who prayed for you and be like well they're not actually that anointed bro you gotta practice maybe they are anointed maybe they are really good at their thing maybe they can be an example maybe they can be a model but at some point they're gonna have to give you lessons and you're gonna have to listen and you're gonna have to practice and you're gonna have to engage discipline so that after a few years you might be able to play like 10 percent as good as that guy I, I realize that we're in this microwave generation where we want everything like you know what I mean? Like, we don't even order, like, burgers and fries and a milkshake with, you know, sauce on the side. We just order number one. Like, everything is, like, fast, right? So we want it fast. So if we're not good at prayer, as soon as we start praying, we think, I'm not a spiritual savant. I'm not as anointed as I thought that I might be. I'm not special. I, I want to take prayer. This is what I want to do to start. I want to take prayer out of the realm of innate ability. I want you to take that out, all right? Take that out. Don't think like I'm either, I either got it or I don't. No, everybody in this room can be an anointed, effectual prayer warrior. I don't care if you're more left brain, right brain. I don't care if you'd rather work with your hands or work with your brain. I don't care if you're a guy or a girl, if you're old or you're young, I don't care where you're from. Every single person in here has been created by God in his image. All right, Jesus is our older brother, and he gave us a model. In this moment, Jesus is the pianist. Just crushing it. He's playing with his eyes. You know, he's like, he's just killing it. You know what I mean? And you're like, man, that's awesome. I want to learn how to play like that. Like, something y'all may not know about me is I'm a closet nerd, but I don't normally admit that. I just say I'm a lifelong learner, and I love to learn. Anybody else in here, you love to learn? Like, I didn't really love to learn in school, I'm telling on myself. Like, I didn't actually read a whole book until I was 21 after the fifth grade, which was a Goosebumps book. (laughs) Y'all remember those? Goosebumps. But when I got older, I realized, man, I love to learn. And my wife could testify to this because when I get in an intake phase, I mean, I will consume content like crazy. So here's what I like to do, a little tidbit uh, of uh, advice, if you will. If you want to learn a subject, this is what I do. So I go to Amazon.com, any particular topic I want to learn about, and I look at the ratings. And whatever is the top 10 books with the highest ratings, I order all 10. (laughs) And then they show up at my house in packages over the next week. And my wife is like, bro, what is this? I'm like fascinated about a new topic, baby. You married a lifelong learner. What can I say? So I got 10 books. I order new highlighters. I mean, I am, I'm a geek. I got to get some new highlighters. I get the little sticky notes. You know, I do the whole thing, right? And then at night, I bug her because I stay awake on YouTube watching lectures while she's trying to sleep. And she's like, smacking me like why are you just go to bed I'm like this is fascinating you know if I find a person that I'm fascinated by I just exhaust all of their content like wow this guy's really amazing I've never ever heard anybody talk like this get all of his books subscribe to his podcast follow him online and I just exhaust it for like three weeks anybody else like that in here okay so the reason why I give you this illustration is because I believe that this is what the disciples were doing to Jesus They were watching somebody who was so good at this skill called prayer. They were like, I am going to just, just ring him out for all the wisdom that I can get. I am going to study and I'm going to approach him. I'm going to say, I am listening to you pray. I am watching you pray. I am sensing what is happening in the spirit whenever you pray. And I don't have the skill set like you have the skill set. So I'm going to come to you and I'm asking you, can you show me how to play the keys like that? So Jesus is like, yep. Gotcha. 101, Matthew 6. Now, he responds to the question in Luke 11, but we're going to read the big chunk in Matthew 6. Verse 5 says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, 
For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at street corners that they may be seen by other people. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. What is their reward? Attention. Right? Some people would rather have attention from men than they would affection from God. And it's revealed through their hypocritical praying. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, I want you to go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father who's in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, notice here point two. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need even before you ask him. Pray then like this. And here comes the the wisdom. Y'all want to say it with me? Our father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory. Amen. Now, we know that is not in Matthew 6 because some manuscripts include it and some don't, that last little line. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory. Amen. Now, you might be tempted to think, okay, since you referred to this being Jesus' first lesson, then it's really, really elementary. But it's not just elementary. It's also fundamental. Now, um, I mentioned, you know, Mr. Toll earlier. Mr. Toll's a basketball coach. Am I right about that? So whenever a kid is off, what do you tell him? Go back to the fundamentals. I just, I'm, is that true? Okay, yeah. Thank you for substantiating that. I was, got, I doubted myself for a minute. I'm like, hold on, wait, maybe that's not what Mr. Toll says. Mr. Toll said, get over here, boy. I'm going to lay hands on you. But, but I, that, like, that's what my dad would tell me as a kid. He said, go back to the fundamentals. And here's the thing that I believe God wants to tell us as his church. If you're wrestling with your prayer life, go back to the fundamentals. It's fundamental, not just elementary. When you look at things as elementary, you're like, well, I got that a long time ago. But the Lord's prayer is not something that you outgrow. Ever. You will never outgrow prayer. And you will never outgrow the Lord's Prayer, no matter how old you get. One of the things I've noticed about older preachers is that they revisit the fundamentals more often. It's usually young, ambitious preachers. We're like, we want to share the heavy revy, you know, the good stuff, the unique stuff, not knowing it's already been shared before. But we're like, this is what we want. But the older preachers are like, go back to... The fundamentals. And so this is a fundamental prayer. And whenever Jesus gives this prayer to his disciples, he is not giving them content to recite. What he's given them is he's given them his life. He's given them his breath. He's given them his heart. And he's given them his prayer. The Lord's prayer is not just something that we recite. The Lord's prayer is something that we pray in accordance to the spirit of Jesus. Jesus is actually saying, you want to get good at the keys? Here's some scales. This is a structure that you can pray within. And if you will, this will will express the type of prayer that God calls acceptable. How many of you guys know that there are some prayers that God does not like? I know, I, know, I know sometimes it's like, well, I'm praying, you know, as long as I'm praying, it's fine. Well, maybe not. Because whenever Jesus went to instruct his disciples on how to pray, before he ever tells us, you are going to pray within the context of this structure of prayer, the first thing he does is not tell his disciples how to pray. The first thing he does is tell his disciples how not to pray. He said, I'm going to teach you how to pray, but let me make sure that you understand that I don't want you praying like this because these are the type of prayers that I don't want to listen to. I will because I'm God and I love you and I'll rebuke you and correct you and give you the opportunity to repent. But these are prayers that I don't like. That's key. So before we get into that, because that's the title of my message over the next nine minutes and 48 seconds, is how not to pray. 
I just thought that'd be a good starter. Is that fine with you guys? Okay, so before we do that, let's define prayer because this is the overview sermon. We're gonna be in this series probably the next six or seven weeks, probably seven weeks, probably nine weeks, <laughs> probably 12 weeks. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we might go back to the wine and the wine skin six months, you know. Um, but this, this is what we're gonna do. And so I wanted to give uh, a little bit of an overview. Now, let's first look at some definitions of prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime I'm looking for a definition, I go before the, I, I type it into Google. I mean, now it's chat GPT, am I right? What's the definition of, you know, I did this because I love to get culture's definition of a word because I love to contrast that to the Bible's definition of a word. Remember, I'm a nerd. So I went to Google and I asked Google, what is prayer? And here's the definition I got a prayer from Google. Uh, prayer is a solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God or an object of worship. Now, that's not exactly wrong, but it is severely limited and it is also lacking when you go to the scriptures looking for a good definition of prayer. The thing that Google does here is it hits on two types of prayer and there's all kinds of different expressions of prayer. We may have the opportunity to talk about that in another series. Right now we're starting here with the Lord's Prayer. But the thing that Google uh, shares with us is that prayer includes supplication and what supplication is asking for help. So that's a part of prayer, asking God for help. That is called supplication. Everybody say it with me. You got it. I'm asking you, God, to supply my needs. Supplication, I'm asking you for help. The second thing that Google says is prayer is praise. And surely prayer includes praise. Praise is thankfulness towards God for what he's already done done. Arthur Pink said this, he's a, you know, theologian from yesteryear. He says, prayer is not asking God for what we think we want, but asking him to want what we think we want. <laughs> you ever notice that? You get in a place of prayer and you start giving God your request. I'm supplicating. And then the longer you sit in prayer, you realize how some of your desires start to be replaced with God's desires. And some of the things that you came into prayer with as pressing no longer feel pressing, but now you're burdened to start praying for something completely different. That's one of the things that prayer helps us with is to help us to understand what we actually need his help with at all or what we need to just let go of. I thank God for prayer because prayer helps me to highlight the baggage in my life that I'm carrying that God never put in my hands. What if today you just decided in this sanctuary that you were gonna let go of everything in your life that God never called you to carry? <laughs> That's what prayer helps us to do when we supplicate. God helps us. Prayer, prayer helps us define our purpose. Outside of prayer, we don't actually know what our purpose is because all of us are being force-fed a steady diet of what culture says our purpose should be. So if we don't take that into the secret place and allow the Holy Spirit to temper what the world suggests should be our purpose, we'll end up following things that God never put before us and we'll never know it because we never prayed long enough for the fire of God to consume the things he never called us to carry. Being a prayer warrior protects your purpose. I promise you, if you were to get close to death, you will pray more. It's true. It's true, you'll pray more. And when that moment comes and you hear from God, what I don't want for you is to be in your deathbed Having then understood, I spent a whole lot of time pursuing things that God never told me to chase. Prayer will protect you from that. Prayer will protect you from that. Let me move on because I gotta get to how not to pray and I only got four minutes and 46 seconds left. 
So here's a few more definitions of prayer. So one of the definitions of prayer that I think is popular amongst Christian circles is, is this. It is talking to God. Uh, many would say that prayer is having a conversation with God, and they're not wrong. And I think that Billy Graham probably inspired this because he gave a definition of prayer that was this. Prayer is simply a two-way conversation between you and God. And I don't want to make any discrepancies with the goat, Billy Graham, all right? So we should listen to Billy. Uh, but I believe that this definition also has its limitations because prayer as casual conversation with God generally lacks an awareness of his lordship because God is more than your BFF. I just date God. We go for coffee. Well, that's great. I want you to go for coffee and do that. Uh, but also you have to remember that you are approaching a king who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Like we didn't vote him in. He's not there by popular demand. He said, no, I'm God. I'm creator, you're creation. Why, why do we bow in worship? Because we come before a king. That's why we're bowing in worship. That's why we're down on our knees because that right there, that, that's, that's courtly behavior. You're God, I'm not. I'm a human being. You created me. You're the savior of the world. You're all powerful, all knowing, omnipresent, omnipotent God. That's you. I have the privilege of being welcomed before your throne. This is unbelievable. See, we have to remember that. So when we define prayers like it's just a casual conversation between you and your BFF, then we, then, then we neglect the reality of his lordship. I, I, I'm not just coming into prayer to listen to God give me some passive suggestions as though he's, you know, tweaking a few facets of my lifestyle in order to help me live better. You come into prayer, God will give you some commandments. And you can't just be like, I decline. You're not declining, you're disobeying. It's not that casual. Ask the priest of the Old Testament when they would tie a rope around their ankles before they sent them into the prayer closet. They're like, bro, you better have your life together. Don't play with God. Don't come in there stained with sin, acting like you got it all together. You're going to die. I, I mean, I don't want anybody to die, but I, I wish that we would approach the throne of grace with a little bit more severity at times. You know, prayerlessness is actually a revelation of your theology. What you believe about God will show up in your frequency of prayer. If God ignores you, doesn't answer you, wants nothing to do with you, why would you ever pray? That's a revelation of your belief about your heavenly father. So here's what Jesus said. I got one more definition of prayer, don't I? Let's get to that one. Next one. Here's an extremely simple relational definition of prayer to pay attention to God. I, li I like that one a little bit better. Let me give you one more. I think it's from uh, J.I. Packer, the next one. Richard Foster. J.I. Packer's also awesome, though. Uh, to pray is to change. Woo, that's heat. To pray is to change. God doesn't change, but he is the great change agent. If you don't want to change, you don't want to pray. Not sincerely. But to pray is to change. So, so here's what Jesus said when he gave this big message. And we got to literally leave here in six minutes. He says, here's how I don't want you praying. I don't want you praying like hypocrites. I don't want you praying like hypocrites. I want you praying like, like real humans. Um, in the Greek, this is the same word that was used at the time for actors in a stage play. So if you pray on stage for a paycheck, but you don't mean it in your heart, you're a paid actor. That's what Jesus calls hypocritical praying. He said, I don't want you to hypocritically pray like the Pharisees do out in public, like, hey, everybody look at me. Jesus said, I don't want mechanics. I want internal communion. I don't, I, I don't care as much about the outside. I want to know What's going on for real, for real on the inside? Like really, 
You know, I understand prayer is very personal, but prayer is not always private. Sometimes you got to pray in front of other people, right? You ever go to a Thanksgiving, they're like, can you say grace? If you don't commune with God, all you did was recite a poem. That's not prayer. That's a, that's a beautiful, eloquent thing to say prior to eating. It's nothing spiritual. It can be accomplished through your own strength. It, that's called hypocritical praying. Jesus said, I don't want any of that. I don't want that. I don't want you to say grace. I want you to commune with me. And, you know, MPs in here, I gave her a shout out first service. This is something I love Mary Pat does. If you ever pray with Mary Pat, especially like the green room, first of all, you're always going to be late to the stage. She always prays too long. Um, But one of the things I love about her is when you listen to her pray, she may be praying with words for you, but her prayer is not to you. It's to God. And and that's why I like it because it's so childlike. She'll be saying... She'd be talking about something that doesn't even matter to the service. You'd be thinking, where's she going with this? She's just having time with her dad. I love that. I think that's awesome. I I want people to, like, listen to me pray and, like, get offended at times. Like, yo, you really have a connection with him. Yes. We got inside jokes and everything. The second type of prayer that Jesus said, I don't really like this kind of praying. It's not hypocritical praying, but it's pagan praying. Uh, You know what pagan praying is? It's repetitions as a magical act. It's mantras. This is what new age is. If I say the same thing over and over again, then I'll change me. If I just say it over and over again, if I just say it. That's what Jesus says. That's what the pagans do. That's not what Christians do. This is not about repetition, although repetition has its place in prayer. You say things repetitiously to help you learn something for sure. But when it's not prayer, but it's done as some sort of incantation or a magical act, that's not Christian praying, that's pagan praying. And let me save you $14.99 from one of the East Nashville head shops. You don't need to go get sage and waft it all around your house in order to cleanse it from the bad energy. Let me just save you 15 bucks for some leaves. Here's what you gotta do. In Jesus' name, I pray in accordance to the finished work of the cross. Every spirit of the enemy that's tried to infiltrate this home, get out in Jesus' name, amen. I just saved you 15 bucks I'm telling you, prayer is way more powerful than incense. But I'd rather you burn incense than sage, personally. Because, you know, they they had incense in the temple, so. All right. Let me give you two more, and we'll be done. Uh, The third one is prideful praying. You remember that scripture when the Pharisee was like, I thank you that I'm not like this sinner right here. That's prideful praying. You don't need to come into the presence of God and start comparing your best to somebody else's worst. That's pride. Number four is self-centered prayer. You remember whenever James said, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly so that you can spend it on your own passions. Right? When you come into a place of prayer, it's not about what you want, it's about what he wants. You got to remember, God is not a part of your life. You are a part of his. God don't get like a little sliver, a little slice. Well, God, this is your portion. I've reserved it for you. I give it to you one day out of the week. No, no, you are in the God life. You are hidden in Christ, right? So let's stand. I want to read one more verse of Scripture because I feel like it will encourage you on your way out. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the Bible says, at the same time, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. If you're thinking today, well, I'm weak in prayer. I don't know how to play the keys. Like, I'm just getting started. That's okay. Even if I can't help you, you know who can? The Holy Spirit. Even if your parents can't help you or your wife or your husband or your friends or the people at your dinner party, even if none of those people can help you, here's who can help you become a prayer warrior. The Holy Spirit. Romans 8, the same, at the same time, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses because we don't even know what to pray for. You ever come into a place of prayer? I don't even know what to pray. Paul said that's how he feels at times. The Apostle Paul. 
but the Holy Spirit will help. But the Spirit intercedes along with your groans that cannot be expressed in words. Remember, prayer is a skill. No skill will be mastered aside from hard work. Therefore, prayer is also work. But it's a worthy work. The saints all throughout history have done this work. They've ventured into the cloud of unknowing and they've come back like Moses with shining faces. And that's what I pray that all of us would get the opportunity to experience knowing, look, I am improving, I am growing, I am getting better at this thing called prayer. God doesn't require that I'm perfect. And even when I don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit will help me, but I know he accepts me not on the basis of my own merit. I don't have to be a good prayer in order to come before the throne of grace, but I plead the blood of Jesus. And I say, because of what he has done for me, I'm saved. Can we just say that again? Say, I'm saved. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray over each and every one of us today. And I ask in Jesus' name that you would place a grace upon our lives to push us into the prayer closet with so much joy, knowing that we are celebrated because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. May we step into it with the blood on our mind. Say, I am so happy to commune with my heavenly father. He doesn't require that I'm perfect. I'm just being faithful. I'm just coming back. I'm just coming back. I'm just talking to you again, God. And that's what he's looking for. And we thank you, God, for accepting us into that place. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen.